Well, welcome to the book we're going to do today, which is uh, Valiant Ambition. Uh, Nathaniel Philbrick is a fabulous historian. Uh, you, you may remember him if you read Mayflower, uh, but today is the story of Benedict Arnold, George Washington, uh, and a very close call for the American Revolution. Uh, it's a tragic story for Benedict Arnold in so many ways. It's, uh, it's in many ways a lucky break for the colonies uh, the way it turned out. Um, why Benedict Arnold uh, betrayed his new country is um, something that's hard to get at sometimes, but we're, in a bit we'll talk about some of the reasons that he did what he did, or why we think he did what he did. And, and, uh, um, but first, I think we need to really understand some things about the war that we probably don't think about very often. The American Revolution started in 1775, really, and it ended in 1783 with the Treaty of Paris. It really ended after we won the Battle of Yorktown in 1781, but there was a couple of years in there that there was some stuff back and forth, but the, the, the nature of the war was we had won it, and then the treaty was in 1783. So uh, call it an eight-year war and until until Afghanistan. I think it was the longest war we ever fought. Uh, but uh, there's some things that you need to know about it. Um, first of all, it's it's really on three fronts. Uh, people don't realize they zero in on George Washington as the commander of the Continental Army, which he was. Uh, but he commanded armies in the, in the central parts, Pennsylvania, New York, in, in that area. There were armies in the north and armies in the south. Uh, General Greene, Nathaniel Greene, was maybe Washington's greatest commander. He commanded in the south. Uh, you know, there was a great battle for Charleston, a blockade at Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, the, the, the battles we won, uh, uh, Cowpens, Kings Mountain, uh, important war in the South, the people like Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox, some of those kind of people. But Nathaniel Green was the commander in the South, and there were ups and downs, but uh, there were several successful campaigns in the South. Now, in the North, uh, you've heard of Fort Ticonderoga. You've heard of the Battle of Lake Champlain. Uh, you, you've heard of our, our uh, Quebec expedition to go into Canada and take Quebec. That failed. Um, Benedict Arnold was actually a, a hero of, of, of Lake Champlain, the Battle of Valkyrie Island. Uh, Ticonderoga, you know, uh, uh, the, the Green Mountain Boys and uh, that sort of thing. So. Uh, there, was, there was a northern theater, and there was a great battle in the northern theater I'm about to talk about in a minute. But George Washington took the central area, and he really had a series of pretty disastrous losses over time. Um, a lot of them around New York. You, you know, we basically, the, the British took Boston at one, at, at one time. The British certainly took New York for a very long time. The battles of Harlem Heights, the, the Battle of Brooklyn, you know. Uh, all that kind of stuff. Those were tough times. The battles around Philadelphia. We lost Philadelphia. Also, the British took Philadelphia, which was the largest city in America at that time. So uh, it was rocky, but, but Washington hung in there and was very steady with that. And so you really had a war on three fronts. Now, before we start talking about some things you may not know about the American Revolution, and particularly as we start talking about Benedict Arnold, I've brought show and tells. Now, they're too heavy. I'm not going to pick them up. Uh, but this, uh, and each one of them is meant to illustrate a really important piece of the American Revolution, a victory that was crucial. Uh, this one that nobody has written on, uh, this one is from Captain Alexander Hamilton's battery at the Battle of Trenton. As you remember, American troops were at their very lowest uh, when on Christmas Eve in 1776, George Washington took a group across the Delaware, the ice-strewn Delaware River, in, in the night and attacked the, the uh, Hessians, were, were mercenaries for the British, attacked the Hessian camp at Trenton and took Trenton. That was a game changer. Uh, Christmas Eve of 1776. This particular cannonball, as with all cannonballs, if, if they had been shot and hit something, they would be in pieces or deformed or whatever. Uh, this one was obviously never fired, but it was found about 125 years ago uh, in, in uh, 
a central part of Trenton where, where uh, Alexander Hamilton's battery was located. So it, it's, it's an unused cannonball from Hamilton's battery. Uh, whether it came over on the boats or came over some other way to get on the other side of the Delaware, who knows. But this is a cannonball from a turning point, the Battle of Trenton in 1776. Um, and I would highly recommend uh, David McCullough's book, 1776. It's a fabulous story of, of that difficult year because the Battle of Trenton turned a tide, certainly a tide of confidence. Uh, but it was not all over yet because on New Year's Eve of 1776, all the enlistments in the, or, or a great bulk of them in his army were to turn over and people would have just gone home and he had to talk them into stay. And that's another great story. It's not told in this book, but that's what may cause you to want to watch, uh, read 1776. Uh, he literally promised all kinds of things he wasn't sure he could deliver, but that he had to promise. And he kept the army together uh, that week after uh, Trenton. And so, turning point. Um, we're going to talk more about this battle. This, this is a cannonball from the Battle of Saratoga in 1777, the fall of 77. Uh, it was a true turning point, and we'll talk about that. Well, let's talk about that now. Um, we were having trouble um, getting France to commit to the United States cause. They just weren't sure, and I won't even call them the United States at that point, but the colonies in rebellion were trying to get French support. That was actually pretty important because the French support would cause the British to have to dilute their, their naval forces. Um, and what happened in fall of 1777 is uh, General Gates was the, Horatio Gates was the American general, uh, up against General Burgoyne, uh, gentleman Johnny Burgoyne. And Gates, with the help of Benedict Arnold as, as a primary hero of Saratoga, beat Burgoyne his army surrendered. Uh, the French took notice. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was also in Paris at that time. He had been working, uh, really importantly, had been working to, to bring the French king and the French over to the American side. He had been lobbying in his very delightful, diplomatic, friendly way. His influence in Paris together with the Battle of Saratoga, this one's from the Bemis Farm area of the battlefield dug up about 150 years ago. Uh, you can't do this anymore. But um, the, the combination of Franklin and Paris and the victory at Saratoga brought the French in. Now, why was that so important? French and British fought each other back and forth for years and would continue doing so in the Napoleonic Wars. But what happened was once the French committed to us and the French started sending a fleet and support uh, the British had to worry about more than just us. We think this was just about us, but the British withdrew a lot of troops and a lot of naval uh, uh, folks, and they headed down to the Caribbean because it was the Caribbean plantations that they wanted to protect from the French. And so bringing the French into the war drained the British forces here and sent a lot of them to the Caribbean to protect their plantations uh, as the French went to war with England. And so this is an incredible turning point, and that's why I so value this cannonball uh, from the Battle of Saratoga. The, big, the biggest, heaviest one here says Yorktown, and of course you know the Battle of Yorktown with the French fleet in support of General Washington. The Battle of Yorktown essentially ended the war. General Cornwallis um, surrendered. And so these cannonballs, I think, symbolize, symbolize the highlights of turning points for us in the American Revolution. Now, uh, there's some things you need to understand also about the revolution before we talk about Benedict Arnold. Um, and some of it is kind of uh, the ugly underside of things. Uh, people who deal in memorabilia and that sort of uh, historical memorabilia, you'll see every once in a while a little statement signed by people that are loyalty oaths. Loyalty oaths to the colonies in rebellion. Uh, because frankly, you know, Tories and rebels lived amongst each other. They often did violence to each other, but they often lived in the same areas. I mean, there were, there were people who were Tories who were committed to Britain, uh, 
uh, most prominent was, was one of the royal governors. William Franklin was Benjamin Franklin's son. Can you imagine the, the elder patriot and the younger royal governor of New Jersey? Um, but that's the, that's the way it was. So uh, keep in mind they lived amongst each other. Uh, also keep in mind that Washington was never uh, safely in command. He was always under attack from other generals who thought they could be better generals. Primary amongst them was Horatio Gates, who, who won it at Saratoga. Um, but uh, Washington was always not firm in his uh, ability to know that everybody believed that he was the general to do all this, but he hung in there and he did it. Uh, so, so there was a lot, of, a lot of conflict in the higher ranks. And keep in mind also that, that um, uh, we're being, this war is being fought by volunteers. Volunteer generals and other lesser officers, very little experience uh, up against an experienced professional army that Britain sent over, not large, but professional. And so basically you're, you're trying to herd volunteers uh, with inexperienced officers uh, leading them into battles. And, and that made Washington's job uh, really hard. I want to read uh, one, one little section. I, I'm going to read a fair amount here because Nathaniel Philbrick is a fabulous writer. Um, this just gives you an idea about uh, the troops. Um, although they called it the Continental Army, the American force was in actuality a collection of regiments and brigades whose primary loyalties were not to their country, but to the states they called home. Given the social and cultural differences between the various regions of the country, soldiers from New England viewed their counterparts from the middle states as strange and almost alien creatures. At one point, while stationed in White Plains, New York, uh, this individual they were talking about, Martin and some of his Connecticut brethren found themselves serving with soldiers from Pennsylvania. Two sets of people, he wrote, as opposite in manners and customs as light and darkness. Consequently, there was not much cordiality subsisting between us. Now, I bet that's one thing you didn't know. Um, because you know, we were always uh, loosely allied during the Revolution. Even after the Revolution, uh, the Confederation government was very loose, had little or no taxing authority. Uh, and that's why we had the Constitutional Convention, you know, six years after we, uh, excuse me, we, we won victory in 83. We had the Constitu Constitutional Convention began in 87. So four years of the Confederation was enough for us. Uh, it, it was really a, a bad form of government, too loose, just as we had been loose under the Continental Congress during the Revolution. Um, but um, that's, that's just the nature of, of what the American forces were. Now, one thing to really keep in mind is um, the lack of taxing power, the lack of contributions from the Continental Congress to George Washington uh, and, and other forces during the American Revolution. Uh, today, document uh, collectors have these pleading letters from General Washington to the Continental Congress saying, please, send money. The time is now. It's essential. Uh, keep in mind, in, in, in the, uh, the winter encampment at uh, Valley Forge in 1779 in Pennsylvania, um, you know, men barely, barely having shoes and coats. It was a miserable winter. We all know about Valley Forge. What we don't know about Valley Forge was that uh, the farmers around were prosperous enough. The food was available. The supplies were there, but the Continental Congress tended not to, not well, in some ways they didn't have the money, but they had enough money and they were very uh, hesitant to advance it to General Washington and pay for what needed to be paid for. And frankly, the farmers around Valley Forge in that Morristown area, uh, the farmers didn't want to sell their goods to the Continental Army and be paid back in the nearly worthless currency that we had, uh, the Continentals. Uh, so, you know, you've heard not worth a Continental. Well, they didn't, want to, they didn't want to sell stuff and get back Continentals. And so, in some ways, Valley Forge is an example of a self-inflicted wound. We had, we had the stuff to provision that army but it was not forthcoming the way it should have been. And that's why Washington was always 
so frustrated with the Continental Congress that these were all self-inflicted wounds. So those are things that I think you needed to know about the revolution and, and, uh, and uh, uh, so I, I think now what I want to do is, is start the story of Benedict Arnold. Um, but I want to start it at Saratoga because Benedict Arnold was in many ways the hero of the Battle of Saratoga. He had been the hero of the Battle of Valkyrie Island on Lake Champlain. Uh, he was one of America's great heroes. Um, his leg was shattered. He took a shot to his leg. It was shattered. He, 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 one of his legs th for the rest of his life was shorter than the other leg. Um, he expected some real recognition out of that. In, in, in many ways, I don't know how to say this, man was kind of a sore head, nursed grudges, um, uh, had, had a great um, Im impression of himself and really never felt like he got the credit or the recognition he deserved. And so Horatio Gates got all the credit for winning at Saratoga. And Benedict Arnold, who thought that his work had really won that battle, did not. And he came out with a, a busted leg and, and, uh, um, and he came out poor. Now, one thing you need to know about him, not only was, was he kind of temperamental, sort of a sorehead, but, uh, but he loved the high life, and, and he incurred a lot of debts, and he was always uh, resentful. And maybe resentment is the theme for Benedict Arnold. Uh, he was always resentful of his lack of promotion when he thought he should prom be promoted into the higher ranks of, of the generals leading the American Revolution on all the fronts. Uh, the lack of the level of pay that he expected, uh, the lack of credit. Uh, now, there's one thing that you do need to keep in mind that's central to this whole story. Uh, he married one of the most beautiful women in the, in the colonies. His wife, Peggy, was, um, Peggy was from a Tory family. And so her family, they were loyalists throughout the revolution. And so keep in mind, he is married to a Tory and influenced by being inside a Tory family. And so uh, all these things come together and his resentments fester. Uh, there's, a, there's a court martial for doing certain things. Uh, he, he cuts a few corners. He was always, in the mercantile sense, ready to make a buck if he could. And he did a couple of things that seemed to be maybe a little bit out of line. General Washington wrote him a, a letter and basically chastised him for, for uh, dishonoring himself in, 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 in one of those transactions. Washington always thought a great deal of Benedict Arnold, so he, uh, so he chastised him, but he, he did so hoping for better times and said so. Uh, and so this is the background of what's stewing inside of Benedict Arnold as, as he doesn't get his promotions, he doesn't get his pay, he doesn't get the recognition, his Tory family uh, remains loyalist. Um, he starts thinking about Benedict Arnold and his future. Now, there's one thing uh, that evidently weighed on his mind, and it weighed on every patriot's mind, and that is if you lost this war, you were going to be hanged uh, in pretty short order. Um, and so uh, fear about the future of the colonial cause, fear about what would happen if they lost, also influenced him to perhaps uh, consider... Uh, maybe staying with the mother country. And, uh, but he was doing this silently. In 1779, this is, this is a year and a half after Saratoga, uh, in 1779 he privately communicates through others to, General, uh, uh, to uh, Governor Clinton in New York, uh, the British governor, and basically indicates a willingness to, uh, to betray his country. Is, is, yeah, that's, that's the bottom line. And, and uh, uh, there's a there's that willingness expressed, and then by 1780, uh, there is a coded letter, which, which we have, and you can see copies of it online. But that coded letter promises to, to uh, do certain things. Uh, in 1780, uh, Benedict Arnold, still, uh, in, in General Washington, still favored him in many ways, just lobbies to be appointed the commander of the of the fort at West Point on the Hudson River. That's where the military academy is located today. Um, so he lobbies and he lobbies and he lobbies and he's lobbying for a reason. Washington makes him the commander of, of our fortress uh, at West Point on the Hudson River. Uh, 
because what he does in that letter, that coded letter, is uh, tell Governor Clinton that he will he will basically figure out a way to hand over the fortress at West Point uh, in exchange for uh, a certain level of yearly compensation for the rest of his life, position in the British Army, all the, all the things he wanted. Um, and so that is communicated. General Clinton agrees to that. There's a meeting at night that year uh, in the dark. Uh, Major Andre, British officer, um, very popular with the British forces and with a lot of Americans. Uh, Major Andre is, meets with Benedict Arnold to work out the final details of the betrayal uh, of the West Point Fortress to the British. Uh, it involves uh, basically what General Arnold intends to do is to, uh, uh, the British will bring troops up to the, to the fortress he will send out troops and dilute his strength at the fortress in a, in a haphazard sort of manner so the fortress falls. If the fortress falls, the Hudson falls. Uh, the colonies are split in two. And so this is a very dangerous moment in the American Revolution. Um, so the deal is made at night between those two and uh, General, General uh, Arnold gives gives uh, Major Andre uh, the, basically the, the, all the plans having to do with the, the site at West Point and, and all the information about the fortress at West Point. Uh, and the plan is that it, Major Andre will take that and will get on uh, the British sloop, the Vulture, which is sitting in the Hudson, and will go back to Manhattan and hand that to General Clinton and the betrayal will begin. Uh, that could have ended the American Revolution. It could have split the colonies. And so uh, General Clinton gets that, and, and uh, he's to get that from Major Andre. But, and I'm going to start reading here a whole lot, but this will give you an idea of, of Philbrick's wonderful style. Uh, this is a hairbreadth escape for Benedict Arnold. It's a hairbreadth last-minute reprieve uh, for the colonies. And it happens in such a haphazard way. Uh, this, I'm surprised that there's never been a movie about this. Uh, to my knowledge, there's never been a movie about this. And so, uh, let me let me start with um, this. This is the plan, uh, as described by uh, Nathaniel Philbrick, to cover all contingencies. Arnold provided Andre with the documents he required, no matter what route he took to get back to Manhattan. If Andre should end up returning through the neutral ground, that's the ground that's split between the American colonists and the, and the British forces back and forth, the neutral ground, you never knew who you'd run into uh, going from, from the West Point area back to, back to Manhattan. Uh, if he was stopped by an American sentry, he gave him a pass which read, Permit Mr. John Anderson, the assumed name for Major Andre, uh, permit Mr. John Anderson to pass the guards to the White Plains, or below if he chooses, he being on public business by my direction, B. Arnold, Major General. That guaranteed him safe passage. If he were stopped by the British, so much the better. From Arnold's perspective, the plan for the surrender of West Point was now in place, and as soon as Andre returned to New York, the British Army, which had already been loaded onto transports, would be heading up the Hudson with the next flood tide. Luckily, and maybe we're a nation today because that didn't exactly happen that way. And I'm going to read this. It's a fairly long, couple fairly long readings, but here we go. Andre was galloping along the old post road just 15 miles from the King's Bridge crossing into Manhattan. 15 miles from Manhattan. Up ahead, a bridge crossed a small stream known as Clark's Kill. Beyond that, a huge tulip tree, 111 feet high, 24 feet in circumference with sprawling fantastically shaped branches loomed over the road. Suddenly, a very tall man dressed in the green, red-faced coat of a Hessian Jager, remember the Hessians are the British mercenaries, the German mercenaries for, for Britain, he stepped out of the shadows. Raising his musket, the man told Andre to halt. It was about time. Finally, Andre had encountered someone from his own side. 
He was wearing a Hessian outfit. He could now see that two others also carrying muskets were coming out from behind a rail fence on the right. My lads, Andre said good-naturedly, I hope you belong to our party. What party? the Hessian asked. The lower, Andre said, meaning British-occupied New York. We do, the tall soldier assured him. My dress shows that. Relief flooded across Andre's face. I am a British officer, he said. Uh, I've been up in the country on particular business and would not wish to be a uh, detained a minute. With that, he held up the gold watch he had offered Joshua Smith. The big Hessian told him to dismount. <laughs> we are Americans, he said, no doubt with a smile. What an awful surprise for Major Andre. He's just said he's a British officer. And they said, oops, uh, they're basically Americans wearing Hessian uniforms. As it turned out, Andre had stumbled onto three New York militiamen who had been assigned to watch the road for suspect persons such as himself. Oh, that, that was a great idea to wear a Hessian outfit to get people to volunteer who they were. Only a few days before the giant in the Hessian coat, John Paulding by name, had escaped from a Brit British prison in New York City. An American sympathizer had given him the German uniform as a disguise, and after making his way to the edge of the Hudson River, he had rowed a small boat to safety the following night. Now he was back with his company in the neutral ground. With Paulding that morning on the Old Post Road were Isaac Van Wart and Abraham Williams, uh, three very important Americans at this point in time. A short distance away, another group of four New York militiamen were monitoring a road to the east. Andre was a fair to middling poet and artist, but not a good actor, and he'd always been relegated to minor roles in the amateur plays produced in Philadelphia and New York. A blush spread across his cheeks. He let out a most unhappy laugh. God bless my soul, he said. A body, body must do anything to get along nowadays. And with that, he held out Arnold's pass. Paulding was the only one of the three militiamen who could read, and he examined the pass. You'd best let me go or you'll bring yourselves into trouble, Andre warned, for your stopping me will detain General Arnold's business. I'm going to Dobbs Ferry to meet a person there and get information for him. Paulding told his compatriots that the pass looked real. Why then, they wondered, had this John Anderson told him he was a British officer? And what was he doing with a gold watch, the kind of expensive accessory that only a few American officers were wealthy enough to own? They had better search him. They took Andre into the thick woods on the west side of the road, carefully replacing the fence rails behind them so that passerby would not suspect that anything unusual was going on. As they demanded, Andre took off his outer clothes, which Williams carefully searched. Andre later complained that they had greedily tore the lining out of his waistcoat in search of money. However, according to New York state law, militiamen such as Paulding, Williams, and Van Wart were allowed to keep whatever booty they might confiscate from a British or loyalist captive. Assuming Andre was the person who he originally said he was, they were completely within their rights. Unfortunately, Williams had not found anything to cast doubt on the legitimacy of the man's past. They searched him, couldn't find anything. That was until they told him to take off his boots. They found nothing in the boots, but according to Van Wart, the bottoms of the captive's two stockings sagged suspiciously. On well, this hangs the future of the American nation. His socks sagged suspiciously. Tucked inside of each of the two stockings were three unsealed letters. Paulding quickly scanned the papers and then cried out, He's a spy. Well, um, what happens then is, a, is a, uh, an, an, amazing, um, uh, an amazing series of events that saved Arnold from being, uh, from being captured, uh, but, but did cause him to have to leave, and, and West Point was saved. Uh, uh, let me read some more at length. Even though it had been more than two days since Andre's capture, word of that event had not reached Benedict Arnold or George Washington, who were going to meet on Monday, September 25th, 1780, at West Point. So Washington is on his way. Uh, neither he nor Arnold know what's happened to Andre. Uh, of course, Washington knew nothing about Andre. Arnold thinks Andre's made his way to Manhattan. Again, a long reading, but really gives you a sense of 
the hairbreadth nature of what happened that day. Washington and his entourage left Fishkill across the river very early that morning so that they could have breakfast at Arnold's headquarters at West Point. They were approaching the fortifications on Constitution Island on the east side of the Hudson when Washington suddenly veered off on the road to the right. General Lafayette uh, claimed to have said, he was, Lafayette was with him, you're going in a wrong direction. You know Mrs. Arnold is waiting breakfast for, for us and that road will take us out of our way. Ah, Washington responded with a laugh, I know you young men are all in love with Mrs. Arnold and wish to get where she is as soon as possible. You may go and take your breakfast with her and tell her not to wait for me. I must ride down and examine the redoubts on this side of the river and will be there a short time. Despite Washington's offer, all his generals felt obliged to accompany him on his tour of Constitution Island. A servant had already been dispatched to notify Arnold of their immediate arrival to let him know of the delay. Washington sent two aides to his house. The aides and Washington's servant ended up arriving in Arnold's headquarters at the same time. Even though his wife Peggy was still upstairs in their bedroom, Arnold urged them to begin breakfast. It's not known whether Arnold was with them at the table or somewhere else in the house, when Lieutenant Allen, after two days of marching up and down the east side of the Hudson, first with Andre in his custody and now with a message for Arnold, arrived at Robinson House. Arnold tore open the letter from Jameson and read, soon he knew that Andre had been captured, Washington already had or was about to receive the packet of papers that he had given Andre. Let's talk about what this all means. General Washington is basically right there, but he decides to take a little tour of the fortifications and his officers with him. They're supposed to have breakfast with the Arnolds. Arnold's sitting at the breakfast table. He doesn't know that Andre's yet been captured and, and now finds out that Andre is captured. And he knows the jig's up. What do you do now with George Washington about to arrive for breakfast? Um, Arnold had always been at his best in the chaos of battle, but this, the ruin of a plan that had promised him not only financial independence, but eternal glory was too much for even him. And yet, despite betraying great confusion, he was careful to instruct Allen not to speak to anyone about the message and to wait for his reply. He found Pe Peggy upstairs in their bedroom, told her what had happened. No one knows what transpired between him. It must have involved desperate tears and contingency plans. To give Arnold the time required to reach British Hell, New York, he needed her help. Washington was due to arrive for breakfast at any moment and then, then proceed across the river to inspect West Point. Judging from the behavior of Washington's aides, uh, Arnold's uh, uh, aides, the commander-in-chief had no suspicion as of yet of Arnold's treasonous activities. Peggy had to make sure it stayed that way for as long as possible. She might never see her husband again, but for at least the next hour she must do nothing to suggest that anything was wrong. Um, there was a knock on the door. Uh, Washington was nigh at hand. Arnold emerged from the bedroom, shaken in a hurry. Frank should get his horse saddled. He was to tell His Excellency that he was on his way to West Point to prepare for his arrival and would return in about an hour. Climbed onto his horse, rather than take the gradual switch back to the riverside, he galloped almost down a precipice to the dock where his barge awaited. He has to get away from there fast. Washington's going to be there in moments and is going to find out that Benedict Arnold has betrayed the revolution. And so he jumps on that horse, heads straight down the hill, not even doing the switchbacks, gets down to the barge, told the coxswain at the barge he had a message to be delivered to, to, to the, the sloop, the vulture, under a flag. Uh, they, they take him across. It's unlikely that Benedict Arnold worry much about John Andre who, Andre, who to his mind just was another casualty of war. One can only wonder whether he thought at all about how his brother officers and country as a whole would react to his treason. The entire premise of this understanding, of this undertaking, had been that the surrender of West Point would result in the collapse of the revolution and the happy unification of the British Empire. For having effected this magical transformation, Arnold would be hailed as the deliverer of his once divided country. But now, even if the British won the war, Arnold would be forever branded as a traitor. Could he feel the vast upswelling of rage and indignation that was about to explode? over the country with the violence of a Hudson River thunderstorm, obliterating any hint that he, that he had once been America's bravest and fiercest battlefield, battlefield general. He must have thought about Peggy and their young son stranded deep in what was now enemy territory. 
Soon they were coming up alongside the vulture. He put out the handkerchief. They went on board. Uh, and that's when the people who rode him on board found out what he was. He explained that Andre had been captured uh, and, and, uh, and treason, along, uh, treason along with suicide is the most self-centered of acts. Unmoored from his past and without us yet a future, Arnold was now the loneliest man on God's earth and he basically got on the vulture and headed down river. His wife made a big show for a while with General Washington, but then General Washington gets the message and General Washington knows what has happened. Why this story has not been told, hair breath, miss, uh, just everybody surprised. Arnold to the ship, Washington arriving and finding to his shock what uh, after Peggy uh, Arnold finishes putting on her show, uh, what a moment in American history. And, and uh, as a result of that, Arnold made his way back to New York, uh, into the safety of, of the British held New York. Um, Major Andre was hanged. One of the most popular British officers, uh, Governor Clinton, was very upset that Major Andre was hanged, but he was, after all, a spy, and he was out of uniform, contrary to instructions. Um, and so, basically, um, the bottom line is that, uh, that the jig was up. But what a lucky break for America. Uh, I want to read a short passage um, about Arnold. Making his agony all the worse was the knowledge that he had come within a whisker of pulling off the coup that might have ended the war. If, now, now, if Andre had not greeted the militiaman in the Hessian coat with the admission that he was a British soldier, a confession he had absolutely no reason to make, West Point would almost surely have fallen. It was not Arnold's fault the scheme had failed. It was Andre's fault. Think about that a little bit. Okay, the American patriots in the Hessian uniforms catch him, if he had said nothing but hand them the pass, he probably would have gotten through. He didn't have to say what he said. His admission is what blew it all. What's the chance of that? But it, it was a very lucky break for the American Revolution uh, in September of, of 1780. Now, um, Benedict Arnold, within the next year and two, Effigies of Benedict Arnold were paraded around uh, all the colonies. Burning uh, General Arnold in effigy became a ma major patriotic project. Um, but uh, Arnold himself uh, became part of the British Army. He was part of an attack on several towns. He, in other words, our general was now a British general fighting American troops uh, uh, in, in the Northern Theater. Um, and, and, the, and the Virginia, too. Um, so, General Arnold later makes it to New Brunswick. Uh, he's a contentious personality. can't get along with people. Uh, doesn't get along with folks in New Brunswick in Canada. Uh, goes back to London and, 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 and lives a, basically lives a long life. Uh, but uh, he gets half the pay he was promised since he didn't, wasn't able to actually deliver. But he gets half the pay he was promised. And, and he gets a position in the British Army. In some ways, he's a pariah. Any traitor is not all that admired by the uh, people he betrays his country to. And so, so he lives in some semi-decent financial condition in England, uh, but not all that well-liked and certainly not admired as a traitor to his cause. But besides being a lucky break for the American side, uh, by just a hair breadth. It's just amazing, this story. Um, one of the most interesting parts about it is the effect that General Arnold had. He had been one of the great, uh, one of the great uh, generals, one of the great uh, fighters of the American Revolution, a real hero. Uh, and now he was a real traitor. And that had its effect in a way that uh, we need to keep in mind also. Uh, Last reading, again kind of lengthy, but I think it says it all, and it says the importance of what these events, these hairbreadth 
events meant. As a warrior at Valcour Island, Champlain, and Saratoga, Benedict Arnold had been an inspiration, but it was as a traitor that he succeeded in galvanizing a nation. Just as the American people appear to be sliding into apathy and despair, Arnold's treason awakened them to the realization that the War of Independence was theirs to lose. The United States had been created through an act of disloyalty. No matter how eloquently the Declaration of Independence had attempted to justify the American rebellion, a residual guilt hovered over the circumstances of the country's founding. Arnold changed all that by threatening to destroy the newly created republic through, ironically, his own betrayal, Arnold gave this nation of traitors the greatest of gifts, a myth of creation. The American people had come to revere George Washington, but a hero alone was not sufficient to bring them together. Now they, were, now they had the despised villain, Benedict Arnold. They knew both what they were fighting for and against. The story of America's genesis could finally move beyond the break with the mother country and start to focus on the process by which 13 former colonies could become a nation. As Arnold had demonstrated, the real enemy was not Great Britain, but those Americans who sought to undercut their fellow citizens' commitment to one another. Whether it was Joseph Reed's willingness to promote his state's interest at the expense of what was best for the country as a whole, or Arnold's decision to sell his loyalty to the highest bidder, the greatest danger to America's future came from self-serving opportunism masquerading as patriotism. At this fragile stage in the country's development, a way had to be found to strengthen rather than destroy the existing framework of government. The Continental Congress was far from perfect, but it offered a start to what would one day be a great nation. By turning traitor, Arnold had alerted the American people to how close they had come to betraying the revolution by putting their own interests ahead of their newborn countries. Already the name Benedict Arnold was becoming a byword for that most hateful of crimes, treason against the people of the United States. Dissent had created America, but as, as had been proven by Arnold, who claimed in an address published soon after his treason, the private judgment of any individual citizen of this country is free from all conventional restraints. Dissent could also destroy it. For the American experiment to work, a way must be found to balance political freedom with the need for political stability. But to get to the point, that point, the War of Independence must first be won. In the months ahead, the voices dominating Congress began to echo less the radicals' cry for moral purity and sacrifice and a shift to a more pragmatic, fiscally-minded effort to provide Washington with the resources he needed to defeat the British. So it was, in fact, a rallying point. And, you know, some of this echoes today when we put our own personal uh, welfare above that of our nation. Uh, when we're divided in so many ways, when we need to be united. Uh, we were the same way in the American Revolution, but the betrayal by General Benedict Arnold uh, galvanized a certain kind of patriotism and commitment to financially support and to work together to win this revolution. And in that sense, the betrayal of General uh, Benedict Arnold uh, was, was something that really uh, gave the American Revolution its impetus to go forward uh, to victory at, at uh, Yorktown. So it's a great story, and I bet you didn't know how hairbreadth it was uh, between Washington and Benedict Arnold, but it was, and someday somebody needs to make a movie. But until then, you've got Nathaniel Philbrick's Valiant Ambition, and it does a really good job of painting that picture. Thank you.